Hello and welcome to another edition of Storyophonic, a regular conversation series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. Please take a moment and rate us or give us a review on your favorite podcast platform. You can follow us at Storyophonic.com as well as on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Now let's meet the host of Storyophonic, Dan Kempel. Across a seemingly infinite span of mediums and genres, Laura Karpman composes brilliant music for feature films, documentaries, episodic television, concert works, operas, and video games. I do think that my multi-genre career has a lot to do with interests, a lot to do with energy, a lot to do with the fact that I don't differentiate, and a lot to do with me grabbing whatever opportunities made themselves available to me over the past 30 years. A four-time Emmy winner and the composer of the Grammy-winning album, Ask Your Mama, Laura's mastery of classic form and modern technology designates her as one of Hollywood's preeminent sonic creators. We visit her studio at the beach, where, surrounded by a museum-worthy collection of instruments, she shares her creative processes and musical methods on Storyophonic. We are here at the edge of America. Mm. We're on the very edge we, where you can go no further in many ways. And we're looking at the Pacific Ocean and we are in the studio with Laura Karpman. Hi, Laura. Hi. I like that go no further. We, I, I think we'll riff on that in the next <laughs> few minutes. I think, it's a, I think it's a good idiom to talk about kind of your career where you continue to go further. So My studio is on the, the ocean as I've been living here for a lot of years. And I think about it living on the edge of a continent. For me to be able to have that space and that vista and that kind of opening for thought has been very, very important to me creatively and personally. I was going to ask about that because that was my first thought when I came in here. It's like, because obviously you have that view. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful thing. I try not to gape around your studio too much but because it's fascinating. There are so many weird instruments that I just want to pick up and play. We'll do. <laughs> Let's do that instead of this. Well, definitely our listeners will, will have a, well, like a way better time. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's funny because this space is new. I, I, we live upstairs and um, my spouse, Nora Cole Rosenbaum, is also a composer. We have a little boy and uh, my studio was always upstairs. But as he got older and older and started making more and more noise and we started making more and more noise and you know, the episodic television work picked up, we really realized that we needed to kind of expand and and, and have a, a larger and a quieter space. So a couple of years ago, we did a major renovation and I took over this space downstairs. So it's like a mom and mom shop here. We live upstairs and we work downstairs, which is like perfect for everything. It's perfect for for him, it's perfect for us. But yeah, and one of my thoughts was, was to create this space that was really artistic. There are no self-aggrandizing posters. It's just all about art and art making and music making. It's a beautiful home studio, but it is also a super pro studio. This is just a couple years old for us and it's it's a dream come true. It's it's really a great space to work and create in and, and I think everybody is really happy here. I like to see all of the uh, indigenous instruments from different cultures and I remember from earlier in your career when I spoke with you, that was one of your trademarks was that you were very tuned into global consciousness in terms of music making. I hope and I think that I am a good listener. That's a skill when you're working on world music. And basically what happened is when we last spoke, I had finished or maybe I was still working on a series for PBS called The Living Edens. Yes. And at that point, I started collecting instruments. And the producers, of course, would go all over the world and they would bring me back something. So I do ask all my friends who travel to pick something up. And the rule is if you can make a noise out of it, it can come in the studio. If you can't make a noise out of it, it's not allowed in. Because as long as we can make some sort of squeak, 
with the help of these the incredible instruments and uh, you know and digital uh, processes that we have at our fingertips, we can hopefully do something with it. You also understand the soul of those instruments. It's not just that you have those instruments at your disposal, but you understand kind of where they fit in the cultural diorama. I think that there are two ways sort of to use these things. One is to, and I think depending on what the needs of the the project are, is to bring in somebody who really is an expert player. And so there's no way for me to completely understand everything about an Indian Carnatic singer or everything about an Erhu. But I do know enough that I can create an environment around that and music that somebody can play. And then we can work within those confines to kind of add those elements to to um, to whatever we're working on if we need to be authentic. Now, the other way is to totally take things th- out of context so that y- they have nothing to do with their um, kind of original home and they become something new again, which I'm also very interested in. One of the trademarks of your career is this ability to transcend rooms that one might put a composer in. So we know you as a feature film composer. Mm. We know you as an episodic television television composer. Mm. We know you as an interactive game composer. Mm. We know you as a concert music composer. We know you as an opera composer. We know that you work in jazz. Oh my God, Laura Carpman. I'm sleepy. I was going to say. You know, there are kind of two answers to the, the, thing, the question that you're asking. And I think probably five years ago, I would give you a really different answer than I'm going to give you now. Five years ago, I would have said, um, you know, I'm eclectic. I like to work in, in all these fields. And that's actually true. And again, I'm a good listener, so that counts. But I think if you talk to women who have been doing this for a while, which I have been at this point, we have to pivot. Mm. And we pivot to opportunity. And um, so I have pivoted to wherever I see a a literally a hole in the dark, a little pinpoint of light. So if I see that pinpoint of light, I'll make a pivot. And, um, you know, I started out doing television movies. Those kind of went away. Mm -hmm. I had to pivot. And so there's that, which is why I find myself going back and forth among genres. Having said that, I don't feel like they're that different. You know, there are technical considerations that are different. If you're working in video games, there are all kinds of technical things that you need to be aware of, different ways that music's composed. You know, you're not dealing with dialogue in the same way. You have to learn about interactivity. If you're working in the concert hall, there are obviously different considerations. Um, you know, in episodic TV, it's you have moments of great inspiration. You also just have to get out 45 minutes of music in three days, which is another skill. If you're working in feature films, you have, you know, maybe a different timeline, maybe not uh, with most of the stuff that that I've been fortunate enough to work on. Um, I've had to come up with really clever ways to deal with smaller budgets. So there's all of those considerations. But I do think that my multi-genre career has a lot to do with interests, a lot to do with energy, a lot to do with the fact that I don't differentiate, and a lot to do with me grabbing whatever opportunities made themselves available to me over the past 30 years. The pivoting is very interesting. I think that that's very telling. Uh, one of our, our guests, Leslie Ann Jones. Oh, kind well, of, she's I, I know, a dear know, friend. She, she kind of indicated something along those lines yeah. to us, especially when we were talking about the dynamics of women within the business, which yeah. we'll be getting to that, believe me, that's a big deal because this is storyophonic and we love women. You do? Good. Yeah, we do. Me too. <laughs> and the contributions. Um, wanted to talk about, you know, there's this, this phrase that politics makes strange bedfellows and, and, and I think music makes even stranger bedfellows. When you began collaborating with Raphael Sadiq, I remember going, really? That's such an interesting combination of, of skill sets. Well, you know, he is my brother from another mother. And when I say that, I mean it in every possible way. It very much relates to this pivoting conversation. I had written this music for a CBS miniseries that was totally and appropriately rejected by CBS. It was like way out there that they wanted like neo-noir. And I gave them like trip hop, acid, hip hop, jazz. I mean, it was really whacked. Anyway, they they threw it all out. I loved it, and I wanted to do something with it. So I, I went to a, a bookstore, and I found 
th- these poems by Langston Hughes, which really inspired me. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about Ask Your Mama later. Yeah. But anyway, how it led me to Raphael. When I was working on Ask Your Mama, uh, Casey Lemons is a dear, dear friend. And I asked her to come in and look at some of what we were doing visually for our bowl performance. Then a few years later, she was doing a film called Black Nativity that based on a Langston Hughes play. And Raphael was doing the songs with Tara Stinson, who's also a dear friend. And a brilliant, brilliant songwriter. If you, have you guys? Yes. Okay. She's been our guest. Great. I mean, she's like, she's a, she is a machine. I've never seen anybody spit out lyrics like Tara and she and I've done a lot, a lot of work together since then. But anyway, so Tara and Raphael were collaborating and Terrence Blanchard, who is uh, Casey's normal composer, who's also all of our heart throbs, he was unable to do that particular project. So, um, she invited me to do it, and Raphael was interested in scoring it. I said, well, let's do it together. And, of course, it made perfect sense because so much of the underscore was going to be evolving from the songs. It's a musical. Um, so so that's how it started, and um, we, we dug each other. And the thing is is that Ray and I, we have, I mean, we have some crossover skill sets, strangely, but we also have different skill sets. I mean, I come from classical and orchestral music. He comes from R&B and soul. And so it was a very um, beautiful connection. And we both um, totally respect each other's work, it, it res- respect each other's artistic space. A lot of the guitars around here are Raphael's guitars. Um, and he leaves them here. So when he comes over, he he has instruments. I buy stuff for him because I know he's a guy that gets inspired by picking up something. And then we went on and did um, a TV series called Underground Together, which was also a really great, great collaboration. We've done a bunch of films. We just did a pilot called New York Undercover, which sadly has not been picked up yet, but we also did LA's Finest, which is uh, Spectrum's first series. So we finished that this winter and we do stuff separately. He works on his own scoring projects and obviously his record projects and I do my own, but when it's appropriate, we come together and it's it's really groovy. Underground is, is a really interesting palette because we hear banjos and traditional kinds of things, but we also might hear like a low end fuzzy synth, mm-hmm. which is which is definitely time travel yeah. on underground. Was that was that a conscious thing or what was the thought? It really was. And that was really motivated by the showrunners, mm-hmm. Misha Green and Joe Pukowski, who wanted it to feel new. Mm-hmm. And um, one of their ways that they were saying that this story goes on was through music. That, you know, you might be looking at at people who are living in the 19th century, but obviously that's not even the beginning of the story, and it's certainly not, sadly, the end of the story. So I think their idea was to really use contemporary music to remind you of that subliminally or or, or con- very consciously. And so that's something we did, and it's, it was a great, great musical palette to be able to play with, you know, taking a banjo and then messing with it and doing something that's traditional and then turning it on this year or using a, an 808 or, mm-hmm. you know, Raphael breathing as, as a kind of a running track and putting delay on it. So it was this combination of kind of, I wouldn't say traditional scoring, but more orchestrally based scoring, plus all of these other instruments and certainly a lot of Raphael's basses and guitars and his singing. So that brings his voice literally and figuratively into the um, into that palette. I saw a question online this last week, and it was asking the question, can composers write songs? And somebody <laughs> said, well, maybe we should ask Alan Menken. Or we, I mean, there, were, there were so many points of reference of composers who certainly can write songs. That's a really funny thing you would bring up. And again, I'm going to speak out of school, but why not? Yeah. So a few weeks ago... I got a call from Rita Wilson, who said, hi, I'm so glad we're working on this project together. And I thought, hi, great. And I... And I know Rita a little bit from Academy stuff and, and from meeting her at a couple of social occasions. Um, she says, I can't wait to work together. And it's like, okay, yeah. And then she said, um, okay, so we're going to write a song together. And I said, okay. And you have to remember, I mean, I'm really like a classical musician. I studied with Milton Babbitt at Juilliard. You know, I have a doctorate. So it's like, yeah, let's write a song together. And I had certainly watched Raphael and Tara work Mm -hmm. and been around a lot of songwriters and I've written opera and I've written songs too, you know, but more jazz. And that's kind of where I come from. 
And so I thought, oh my God, I have to write a pop song. And I was just completely terrified. So I just started listening to the music. When I stopped listening to pop music was like 1974 or so, you know, because I started listening to jazz. So, you know, like when I was a little kid, I thought that I wrote Norwegian Wood. You know, like you get it in your head and you're th thinking, yeah, so so like it becomes way, way out to sea in the breeze will always be when I was a kid. So I made up new lyrics. I thought I wrote it. Anyway, that's, a, again, another aside. Taking me back to Rita Wilson. So she says, okay, well, I'll come to your studio. And there, there are reasons why this worked too um, for this particular project. It was going to be an on-camera song in a film that I'm scoring that Eleanor Coppola is directing. And... So there had to be lyrics, and she was singing this song in character, and then, of course, we had to, you know, do it together. And so I just started listening to both sides now and some of the music that I loved when I was a kid, you know, um, Joni Mitchell and other songwriters, Carol King. And this was the tapestry, of course, that, um, that she wanted to work from, too. So I got really lucky. And so she came over, and I, I had... I mean, literally, like, two seconds to come up with an idea. So we worked together in two sessions. In fact, she just recorded it at the Village on Sunday. And I know from working with Tara and, and working on Jump with them as well, mm -hmm. I, like, get it. But when you talked about studying world music, I study pop music in the same way. Like, okay, are we doing four chords now? Is that, like, what the vibe is? Can I do a fifth chord? And... It's funny because Raphael has told me so many times that um, I'm his professor, but the truth is he's been mine. And so I think in terms of songwriting and, and learning a lot about pop music production and about what resonates with people in that way, um, I have learned a lot from him and, and from Tara too, Tara Stinson. So I like it. It's fun. I mean, I hope I'm okay at it. I'm bad at lyrics. I can't do that at all. <laughs> I, I like really suck. But... Um, it's nice because you have to get to emotion so quickly and there's no time to dilly dally around, but it is different. That is a different skill set, and it's, it's hard to write a great song. Respect. I mean, it is hard. Yes. To write a deceptively simple song is a very complex pattern. It's very true. Um, yes. Jump. I, I got to revisit that as I was putting together my playlist of things that I was listening to from you. And, uh, you know, since we've interviewed Tara, um, that, that came up. So that was, that was terrific. Let's go to the Langston Hughes project for a second. As I read, Langston Hughes had actually done annotation of musical sounds that he heard for the poems. Is that correct? So the poem sort of consists of, you could say two parts, but they're two sides of the same coin, which is, by the way, an analogy that he uses a lot throughout the poem. You basically have the body of the poem in all caps. So what we would call a kind of a scream and contemporary, you know, email discussions. I don't even know, nomenclature, I suppose. Mm -hmm. In the right-hand margins of the poem, there are musical directions that are italicized. And he says what he hears. It's sort of like sitting with the smartest director, you know, sitting with somebody on my couch in my studio saying, could this be like a 12-bar blues morphing into German leader? And that's quoting directly from Langston Hughes. So, you know, we talked about sort of my, my musical pivots. This was perfect for me, you know, because I can do that. Because I've had to learn to do that. And I think a lot of media composers do that. It's certainly not, not um, specific to me. So I felt that I could do it. Um, and that it was not easy to do because it was complicated. And um, that Langston Hughes book that I bought to kind of set those poem, the uh, songs from CBS, um, had Ask Your Mom in the back of it. And uh, yeah. it was, um, it sat on my shelf for a lot of years until I had the great honor of meeting somebody who knew Jesse Norman, let's put it mm -hmm, that way, mm -hmm. the great opera singer. And we were being connected to work on a different project. And for the first time in my life, I said, oh my God, that other project sounds great, but she'd be perfect for Ask Your Mom. And five days later, I was sitting next to her on her couch, her singing gospel music into my ear, and uh, we, we were off to the races. Nice, yeah, nice. It's beautiful. We'll be right back after this. At Stereophonic, we are obsessed with great sound. Every episode of our podcast is edited and mixed using the software plugins created by Isotope 
the secret weapon of professionals around the world that inspire and enable creativity, save time, increase productivity, and deliver professional sounding results. To find out more, visit isotope.com. That's spelled I-Z-O-T-O-P-E. And now, back to our podcast. As a point of reference with Pig Meat Markham, I've always wanted to say that on Mike, Pig yeah. Meat Markham. I thought that was a really interesting point of reference. Well, do you know the, the Here Come the Judge Yeah, thing? sure, sure. So basically, he's considered sort of the grandfather mm -hmm. of hip-hop because mm -hmm. some people think that that's the first kind of foray into hip-hop. And, you know, for Hughes, I think it was, I mean, he was using contemporary musical references. We talked about the right-hand margins. They not only say how the music should sound, but they, they, their clues, that was a, a you know, it's called um, Shades of Pig Meat. Mm -hmm. So it was obvious to draw from Pig Meat Markham, but there, it also was referencing shades of, of people of color. Yes. So there are always multiple, multiple um, metaphors in every single thing that have their layers of metaphors. A lot of composing the thing was being a musical detective. In that particular movement, he says, uh, the far off, I can't remember the exact quote, but he references Ailey Ailey. And I thought, well, why is he referencing that? Well, it turns out it was a Johnny Mathis recording that was made at exactly that time. So think about that. Within this movement, Shades of Pig Meat, you have a Johnny Mathis recording of a traditional Jewish song. So he's covering tons and tons of groundwork in terms of what he's talking about in these musical references, too. And, of course, Johnny Mathis was... I don't know if I'd say a controversial figure, but certainly, you know, he was the black Sinatra. Yeah. And, and so what does that mean? And then, you know, he became, uh, he references Sammy Davis Jr., who married a white woman. And uh, so uh, there's all this stuff that comes up and you kind of have to read it. But when I, I worked with the Roots on, on Ask Your Mama, and so Questlove plays along with the, the Pig Meat Martin track. Yeah. And I mean, it grooves. That guy is a monster. Talk about people who really know their history. I mean, um, Questlove, you know, he apparently has a library and a librarian of, of music in his home. He's a monster. Yeah. He yeah. is one of the greatest musicians mm -hmm. I've ever worked with. And to work with him and Jesse Norman on the same project and Black Thought, too. I mean, it was nuts. When we recorded the album, we recorded it in his drum room at NBC, which is tiny. Really? Yeah. Tiny. And so he was watching Soul Train the whole time while we were recording just on the TV. But it's like, I don't even know. I mean, the, the room is maybe 10 by 10 or whatever. I mean, there's no room for mics or anything. And I mean, it sounds great because that guy gets sounds out of his drum. So I asked him to do a solo before the movement started, Jazz Tet Muted and Ask Your Mama. And he, I said, you know, you are the inheritor of Art Blakey. And he played a solo that was just like out of, you go out, you, out of your mind when you hear this thing. It's so compositional. And I mean, this guy composes with drums in the most astonishing way. And so it was, a, you know, it was, I mean, it's a pleasure. Oh, so cool. Yeah. But what an unexpected project. Yeah. You couldn't design that. I mean, you know. Well, it was, it's funny because it definitely came out of, you know, where my musical head was. Mm. But it was hard for a lot of people to get their heads around. Um, one of the things that I was concerned about was taking this on as a white woman. So I went to um, sit down with Arnold Rampasat, who was Langston Hughes' biographer, who teaches at um, Stanford. And he said, listen, if you can make this thing sing, do it. Um, he said Langston uh, uh, collaborated with all kinds of people, and so you should. And in fact, it's in Nora's room, but we have a signature of... Um, Langston Hughes, a, a birthday card he sent to Margaret Bonds, who's a great composer, and um, and they collaborated. They did the first kind of rendition of Ask Your Mama. And uh, and then uh, Thelonious Monk was supposed to do it, but never did it. Um, and then uh, lots of people have done it. I mean, it's I'm not the first, I won't be the last, which is a really gorgeous cool. thing. Yeah. Your background as you mentioned, is in classical music and in jazz. Mm -hmm. And and I believe that uh, you were you, you sang when you were young? You scat sang? I did. I mean, I just, 
I don't know how it started. I guess my mother would listen. She had a really ec a, a unbelievably eclectic taste in music. And I remember, like, she loved Wes Montgomery and Miles mm -hmm. Davis, but there was, you know, Leonard Bernstein and Stravinsky and, you know, and all kind, a lot of flamenco. She was a, a flamenco dancer herself. So there was all of that as well. Um, so I think I just started listening to a lot of different kinds of music when I was, when I was little. And um, I just started, you know, I started piano lessons Seriously, I think when I was about nine, I started composing younger when I was at seven. That's when I thought I wrote Norwegian, Norwegian Wood. Wood. But nonetheless, I was writing more original music. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, so I started, like, learning all those Ella Fitzgerald solos. And, you know, I was, I was pretty good. I mean, it was never like, oh, my God, this is the most spectacular thing you've ever heard. But I did that. Um, I played in bands, and I was, I was just, I just consumed jazz. And um, I went to Phillips Andover, and I used to, I used to get a fake ID and go into Boston on the weekends and go to the, all the jazz clubs. And at that point, like everybody was out touring, so I got to hear really a lot of live jazz. But I was also seriously studying classical music. And when I got to college, um, my principal instrument was voice, so I sang opera as well as jazz. So that's why, for me, a piece like Ask Your Mama, w that's not, oh, my God, th that's a big stretch. For me, that's part of the way that I think about music. I don't, I don't draw lines. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to me. It, it, it's just about what resonates in terms of structure and, for, and you know, formal ideas and, and inspiration or, I mean, obviously things that you work on or get influenced by other people and whatever media you're working with, but that connection of jazz and classical music and, and hip hop, which I really love too, mm -hmm. it, it made sense to me. It's in, it seems kind of diametrically opposed in a certain way bit because jazz is based on so much improvisation. There's the improvisational elements of it. I've thought a lot about this, and I think that um, that improvisation is composition. Mm. And I think it's a way, it was a way for people who didn't know um, how to read music to write music. And I think that there are a lot of questions I have about all of that. Like, why can't you copyright a solo when it's quote unquote improvised? It makes no sense to me. If you listen to John Coltrane's um, My Favorite Things, that whole middle section, that's a new composition. That has nothing to do with the original melody. That goes into a whole nother place. Harmonically, melodically, that's a new composition. So I think that jazz is a springboard for composition. I think a lot of media music, a lot of film music is is written down improvisation. Mm. You know, a lot of the way a lot of us work is you see the picture, you go for it, and it for me it returns to very much the way I wrote music when I was a kid, when I wrote Norwegian Wood. Now, <laughs> why that's become a theme of this podcast, like I have this. no idea. I'm really going to stop with that. <laughs> but, yeah, it's kind of natural. Um, it's a natural way of working. So I think about it as composition. You listen to four Ella Fitzgerald records where she does the solo for how high the moon they're very similar mm. it's not like as wow this is off the cuff it's like she worked this stuff out Interesting. and that's not to dismiss the incredible crazy abilities of people to make stuff up on the spot because it's pretty nuts you know um a couple of years ago i went with common and Raphael to um cuba with the academy and common did a um, a freestyle and it was like it was crazy i mean he incorporated my whole name and Nora's name and cube i mean it's like it's like how in god's name do you do that and he said you have to be willing to make mistakes and then fall into those mistakes and i think i mean again this comes out of jazz you know you've got it like if you go outside of what you thought you were going to do and you lean into that then you're creating something really unusual Part of your process, of course, is is dealing with the storyline, an arc of a storyline, um, the composer, a storyteller. Um, you mentioned Eleanor Coppola, mm -hmm. and you did her. You worked on her first film, correct? Yeah, yeah, uh, which is very lovely. I, I've listened. To, I've been listening to the music from yeah, that thanks. as well. You know? well. That's jazz. Yeah. That's all like French, French 1960s. Yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. It's got it's got that whole idiom. Yeah. What kind of conversation did you have, like, say, in a situation like that with with her? about the music for the film. You know, it's funny because she was a first-time director at yeah, 79. I knew that. <laughs> which is just so, ins she is an inspiration. She is an, is just a fabulous, fabulous person. And of course, we don't even need to talk about her family. Yeah. And yeah. 
the kind of courage it takes after uh, having a, a Roman Sophia and her husband, yeah. of course, to come out and make your own film. Yeah. So I took her a playlist, and I, I've never done that with another client. I, I just played her lots of stuff, and I said, do you like this? Do you like this? Do you like this? So, of course, I took the Jean-Pierre Rompal, you know, stuff, and and I took um, I took some like remixed French music, like like Verve remixes and stuff like that, and tried to find out if we could give this a contemporary feel. But you know, it starts at the Cannes Film Festival. And have you ever been there? No. So, if you have you been to Sundance? Well, yes. Okay, so yes. you've been to Sundance. I mean, at Sundance, like you're lucky if you get to premiere with your Uggs dry. Okay. <laughs> Can is the opposite. It's it it's like the perfume of that place is so crazy. It's so intoxicating. You know, the celebrity is intoxicating. The designer stuff is intoxicating. We've got Gucci, the Mediterranean, and celebrities. These are all things that I enjoy tremendously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I I jest. But it's like you have to lean into that again. You've got to lean into those kinds of movies when you're looking at a a movie that opens up on the French Riviera. So it was not a, an obtuse choice. What happened is we wound up using like camera clicks from the 60s as percussion. And then I brought in Una Lemperer to sing and to do some score stuff. But I sort of talked her into letting me do the source mm -hmm. because I it, there's something magical about the whole film. And I thought that if I could do the source music as well as the score, the score and the source could tumble into each other in a way, you know, so that it, it could be this kind, kind of like seamless thing. So I, um, I chose a Satie song, Je Te Veux, and then she sang that. And, um, and then there was another tune where the guy, the actor actually sings it on camera. So I used that and sampled from it. And I sampled from old French music and then brought in, you know, some performers, a great accordion player and, you know, and, and just played with all of those sounds, but definitely, you know, rework them for a, 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 the the twenty first century world too. You're doing another project with her, is that correct? yeah. I mean, I I, I can't totally talk about mm -hmm. it because I think it's it's evolving. Um, what I can say is she's made two short films, and now she's made a third short film, and Rita's in it, and we wrote a song for it. It's called Late Lunch, mm -hmm. and it's it's a beautiful beautiful project. She looks at you know, middle aging or aging, I should say, in a really refreshing way. And I think that her movies are about that. It's about how do you navigate aging? How do you navigate relationships? How do you navigate maturity? How do you keep things fresh? How do you love? How do you deal with loss? And this is what she's working out. And it's fantastic. I want to go into talking about uh, kind of what we see as a luminous, bright, fabulous, expanding landscape. And to kind of to paraphrase a quote that I read from you, it was sort of like, the numbers are bleak, but the future is endless. And it had to do with what we are seeing now as the emergence of, of women composers. And again, because of, of our sunny perspective, you know, and we, let's stay sunny. Let's stay it's sunny. a little cloudy outside. It's <laughs> June gloom, but we're going to ignore that. But it's and, and in every possible ramification of that sentence. And as one of the founders of the Alliance of Women Film Composers, and you know, we joke with it that you probably could have had your first meeting in a Prius. Yeah. But now, you know, four or five hundred people mm -hmm. are will come to your events. I mean, it's, it seems like a terrific thing that you that you saw that you were able to become a part of. Mm -hmm. You want me to talk about it? I do. All right. So um, basically a couple of things happened. You know, these are long, long tales. But I've had a, a friend of mine who's a painter, and she and I would talk over the years about stuff that we saw. I won't even call it sexist because I don't even think we knew. Yeah. You know, when I started... I thought it was a bright, shiny future. The 70s were gone. It was like the world's opening up. I was the only girl anywhere I went. It, you know, the only woman in my composition class at Juilliard. If I, I went to Tanglewood, I was the only woman there. When I came out here, there were very few. Nan Schwartz, Shirley Walker were working, and then Rachel Portman emerged, and Anne Dudley. But, you know, it was always very few. But, you know, it didn't bug me. Um, but I started noticing um, that I would do the exact same kind of project as a male counterpart. I mean, like, literally, like, you know, 
Sandlot 2 or mm-hmm. Ace Ventura, Pet Detective 3. And then he would do, you know, the other movie that was two or three. And then he'd get a big feature. And it's like, I just thought, huh, well, that's weird. I must be doing something wrong. Because, you know, I blamed myself. I think a lot of us do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so this friend of mine and I would talk about this all the time. And I think when I met Nora, who's 20 years my junior and who went to Juilliard and who studied with Milton Babbitt and who's a fabulous composer, it hit me like a brick that there might be fewer opportunities for her than there were for me. And that not only was it not opening, but it was closing. And uh, we had always like gotten by by, you know, by, it's like, like, like we talk about, you know, looking for the hole in, in, or looking for the light in the, in the darkness. You know, I skirted here and here and I know you interviewed Miriam Cutler who mm-hmm. made a different choice. You know, she stayed in one mm-hmm. field and to right. that or Lolita Ritmanis mm-hmm. who has done pretty much fundamentally, you know, animation. So everybody kind of staked their ground. You know what I mean? I was moving around like a like a race car for whatever reasons. And, you know, and as we can tell, after having spoken for 30 minutes, probably there are a multiplicity <laughs> of reasons for that. But regardless, um, so we when we would go to the, like, B, we're all BMI members, not all of us, of course, but but mm-hmm. Lolita, Miriam, and I, who are the founding members, are all BMI members. We go to the BMI dinners. Miriam was a good friend, but Lolita I didn't know well. And you kind of looked at each other out of the corner of your eye and like, what's she doing? And because we're trained to be competitive with each other, women sure. are. Everybody is, and it's a competitive field, and, and I, I actually enjoy that. But um, this was not healthy. And... Um, we were not a sisterhood. And then we had a lunch all together that Doreen Ringer Ross put together. Mm-hmm. And I almost canceled because I was working on Black Nativity. I called her that morning. Yes. I said, I can't come. I got a main title due. She said, you've got to come. Yeah. So I went. And we all sat around a table. And Wendy and Lisa were there who I'd never <laughs> met. And all of us. And it was like, enough of this suspicion. Enough of this not trusting each other. And I'll tell you... Another little aside, I just did this incredible documentary series for Steven Spielberg and Alice Gibney. It's called The Anatomy of Hate or Why We Hate. And there's one amazing scene where they have these two monkeys that share more DNA with us than than any other creatures on the planet. And they, they, they did an experiment where they gave these monkeys love green grapes. They gave them green grapes. They each gave them equal green grapes. And then they started putting all the green grapes in the one monkey's dish. And the other monkey went crazy. So the truth is we've been dealing with like one green grape for a long time that we sliced up among a few of us and it came to an end. Now, simultaneously with that, and this is really, really significant, Martha Loutson, Dr. Martha Loutson, who does research out of um, uh, San Diego State, included composers in her research for the first time. And this is 2014. So we had a figure, which was at that point, 2% um, of the top 250 feature films were composed by women. And so that figure, that's not about looking at somebody at a BMI dinner. Or that's not mm-hmm. about, oh gosh, his career is this, because that's whining. Numbers don't whine. So we had numbers that were that that became a significant tool, and so um, we formed the alliance. Which at first we thought we'd do a concert, and you know that would be that. And then um, a friend of mine, who's a political activist, said, "You know, you need to do a directory." And I said, "Yeah, okay, great, let's do a directory." But a directory is super significant because then it shows that it's not just for people who can fit into a Prius. It's many people. And we've always been there, but we have been unamplified and unnoticed. And that is what is significant. Now, why that is, I really don't quite know. Why? And we talked about this just off the record earlier Earlier, when I was talking about my piece for the L.A. Phil, where I amplify the work of three three women composers from the turn of the century. Why have... Why have these works of women been overlooked? I don't know. I I mean, I can say, of course, it's sexism, but it's something more than that. You know, it's just this pervasive invisibility, which is just, we're we're done. 
now with that. So, so the the alliance started, and um, you know that first night we got like twenty five people in our directory, and it has grown and grown and grown, and proved to be a really wonderful support network for women. And I helped launch the uh, women's initiative at the academy, where I'm now a governor, yes. finishing my third year. You know, so we're just starting basically. This is just all beginning. Yeah. You mentioned the project where you had researched songs, uh, patriotic songs, right. and you came up with a, an incredible like portfolio that were written by women, but we didn't know about them. No, we didn't know about them. I didn't know about them. I yeah. didn't know that I'd be able to find it. I was going to do, this is for the LA Phil piece. Yeah. I was going to do, like, take Susan Turnin on its ear. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this piece won a Grammy that took Susan Turn turned it on and said, I thought, you know what, maybe I won't do that. Maybe that's not a good idea this year. And uh, although the piece was fabulous, I thought, I wonder if there's any patriotic music by women composers. And I had just written, I had this incredible experience where I'd written this piece for the U.S. Army Field Band. And I would based it on the life of General Anne Dunwoody, who is mm-hmm. the first um, four-star general in all the military. And um, she sent me a challenge coin for my service to the Army which is just like, it blew my mind. I never thought that I would do any service for the army, much less a good service, you know? But so I wrote this piece and I was really pleased to highlight her because she is truly astonishing. And then I, I don't know, I just, I mean, I've always cared about patriotism in my music. I think the Langston Hughes piece is really patriotic. And uh, so I wanted to do something summer piece for the Hollywood Bowl, but I found these, you know, these three women who had written this, I mean, more than three. I found hundreds of pieces by women, and I chose three. Um, one of them is by Mildred Hill, who wrote Happy Birthday, the most famous song in the English language, and nobody knows her name. So that's when I say there's a, a pervasive invisibility. Why doesn't everybody know Mildred Hill wrote Happy Birthday? Yeah. You know? Or Carrie Jacobs Bond, who w- wrote the most famous songs at the end of World War I, but have you ever heard of her? No. She was more famous than Irving Berlin. So yes. why are we left with Irving Berlin? Not that he's not great, but that's th- like that's the question mark for me. That's what we have to change. That's why we have to continue to amplify this music and say, hey, you know what? We've always been here. So listen to us now. I think that's the bright future. Yes, I, I do too. I do. And, uh, you know, I, one of our guests was Pinar Topric, mm-hmm. who, you know, did the first you know, action film in the Marvel universe, mm-hmm. which is just great. So we're so happy that this is happening. Yeah. You know, it's a good thing. So if we got women composers listening, believe us, they have a support network now. Yeah, you do. And, and but we have to support each other. And um, we have to be a sisterhood. And that is what's going to push us all forward. What's it like to do a gig at the Hollywood Bowl? That's crazy. Tell me. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> It and and I got another one this summer. But um, here's the thing about the Hollywood Bowl, and you know, as a native Angelino, I mean, that's crazy. That's it. You know, I mean, it, we 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 had done it at Carnegie Hall first, which is no slouchy house, and then um, we came out, and Jesse um, was um, couldn't come to a part of one of our rehearsals, so I sang her part. Oh wow! And so it was me and Nina Freelon, oh, and and. Um, and Deidre Aziza, who's a great singer. And and uh, I was singing at the Hollywood Bowl. I mean, it was like crazy. So that was, was great. You didn't put on a long gown and get a wig for the moment? or I didn't. I just tried not to be terrified <laughs> of, you know, <laughs> of anything, of her showing up, of, you know. But no, she was super supportive, and, and it was fun. And, and, you know, it was good. I mean, I did it. There was a purpose to me doing it, but it was also incredible to hear your voice and those big speakers. And Oh, my God. It's nuts. It's great. What a great, you know, listen, I've done things mm-hmm. I never thought I would do. I did this crazy performance with Sa Ding Ding, who's a, um, a, a Chinese pop star. And we did a performance for President Xi of China, his wife, and uh, uh, Prince William and Kate. And it was at a royal house in London. And it was just the four of them sitting on the bottom floor with their translator. And they cleared out the whole top deck because they thought that, you know, they didn't want anything to, you know, to, there was a security issue. But I had to conduct the choir. 
So I was the only one on the deck, and I didn't have a music stand because I didn't know I was going to have to conduct the choir. And I was afraid that my music was going to fall on President Xi's head. And, like, I, I didn't even know what was what kind of jail they would put me in if I made it to jail. And so I'm there, like, in this royal British house with, with a prince and princess and a president beneath me. I think the music's going to fall on the head. You know, having done arrangements for Sa Ding Ding, I mean— I've been the craziest places. It's a surreal moment. It was crazy. Do you and like, so was the bull. Do you like conducting? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I've I seen do. videos of you. You look like you enjoy yourself. I do. I do. Yeah. I like it. I'm left-handed, so that's um, that's a thing. But um, but yeah, I do like it. Now, you, you studied you extensively. You, as you mentioned, you have a doctorate, mm -hmm. um, and you, you studied extensively. Sometimes within, within other forms of music, there's less like book schooling, you know, and, and more experience or intuitive kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, what do you tell composers that are coming up that would like to be doing this? I mean, is, is, is that type of a formal education going to be required? You know, look, I work with people who don't know how to read music and they're the greatest musicians I've ever worked with in my life. Having said that, I use my musical tools all day, every day. So, yeah, I think, I think it's good. It's really good to 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 learn as much as you can. I think ear training is essential, especially for work in film music, because you've got to be able to identify mistakes and mm -hmm. fix them on a scoring stage. I think all my learning comes in, you know, tremendous handy. I, it's it's not even that. It's like it's like you know going to fix a car without any tools. You might get lucky and you know be able to pull out your pantyhose or something, but you know it's good to. I don't, I, I, why I'm doing the car analogy, I don't know, because I have no idea how to fix a car, nor what it would take at all. So maybe I should get off this one. But yeah, yeah, these are tools I use all the time. And even the formal training, um, you know, I was thinking about it. And and I didn't, and when I was writing the program note for the LA Phil piece, which I just finished, um, literally Sunday, and I was thinking about studying with Milton and writing 12-tone music and grabbing on to sort of, these theories about how to structure music formally. And then I was thinking about sort of media music, which, you know, you have a structure, an inherent structure. Or if you're doing an opera, the poem gives you the structure. But what was so nice about using the music of these three women is it gave me a structure, you know? And so I had this kind of propulsive rhythm that I used that was, you know, that's the really heart beat of the score but or of the of the piece I should say not the score but um their melodies inspired me so I'm I so the reason why I bring that up in this context is I gravitate to formal structures to incorporate in my music even if it's music that has no media attached to it at all or or doesn't you know doesn't rely on an outside formal structure and that comes out of studying formal structure in music and how composers throughout music history have worked with formal structure and found their own way and their own voice within very tough rules. There's a guy named Mozart, you know, he's pretty good. <laughs> he's written some good tunes. So Laura, is there a director that you have not yet worked with, with whom you would like to collaborate on a feature film? Oh and my! If so who would it be? Marinaire. Mm. I love her work. She's someone I would love to work with. Period. Oh, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Well, yeah. that was easy. Yeah. I mean, I thought I was going to have to scramble there for a minute, but I really would love to work with her. Nice. Yeah. Nice. We've talked about the fact that you are very educated. You have that doctorate degree. And mm -hmm. so you've learned a lot, you know, as a student. What do you learn as a teacher? Because you also were involved in the teaching aspects. And yeah, I teach at USC in the scoring program. I learned a lot as a teacher. I mean, it, first of all, I mean, just very, very practically, you learn the tools that young people are using, and that's actually really great information to have. I mean, it's like people are out there and they're messing with new stuff, and I love that. It's great. But I think also watching people um, figure out what their artistic process is clarifies yours. And that's what I love about teaching. And I love also, obviously, helping people and mentoring people. And my, my assistant, Kyle, who's in there someplace, was my student at USC. And the, I have a beloved group of students who circle around here every once in a while and, you know, poke their nose in and say hi. And it's good. Terrific. I like it. Terrific. 
Laura Cartman, you are so fascinating. We could uh, we could move in here and talk to you for days and days at a time, but that's probably not going to happen we'll set up on a this pot. day. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys coming down and, and being so well prepared and asking me such great questions. We love your work. Thank, Thank you, you for being our guest on Storyophonic. My pleasure. Thank you. This episode of Storyophonic was produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasic. The music in this podcast was used by permission from Laura Cartman. Our theme music was written and produced by Dusty Gray. <laughs>